Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Rob is back from vacation, and we are at it for our weekly chat on geopolitics and markets. Um, A few housekeeping notes from me. If you haven't rated or reviewed the podcast, please consider doing so. It takes a few seconds of your time, but is immensely helpful for us. If you want to talk about our wealth management services or our research services, um, all the things we talk about in this podcast are really just the tip of the iceberg of the things that we do for managing client funds or providing research to institutions or to high net worth individuals. Um, You can email me at jacob at cognitive.investments if you want to learn more. You can also email, email me there if you want to tell me how wrong I am about certain things, or if you just want to connect. Some of you have been reaching out and connecting, and I've had some great conversations with you. Thank you so much. And some of you have been telling me how wrong I am, and I appreciate um, all of you too. Uh, I'm here for all of the discourse and the debate. So other than that, let's get to the episode. Cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Fresh from his vacation in Corsica, I wish I had had the podcast video turned on, Rob, to catch your reaction to when I broke the news to you that the Boston Celtics had traded Marcus Smart. But alas, you'll just have to trust me, listeners, that he really, he looked as distraught as his stoic face ever looks in general. So I hope you can make it through the podcast. Okay, I know your emotions are just swirling inside of you, Rob. Well, my eyeballs almost popped out of my head. So <laughs> I'll put them back in and we'll get going. Um, I, global headlines are like always weird, but they're particularly weird today. Like I'm on the Wall Street Journal website and we've got killer fungal infections and, you know, the submersible sub that was looking for the Titanic that's disappeared and the back and forth between Justice Alito and ProPublica. Um, I, ever since we talked about that Nature article now, I just see all the negative things that get thrown on the front pages of things. But there's more interesting stuff going on. Um, the general, well, not the general theme. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about inflation and probably the housing market, and we're also going to talk about cars a little bit, and they're all sort of connected. Um, let's start with inflation, though. Um, the UK. Let me just get the figure up in front of me. Consumer prices in the UK rose eight point seven percent year on year, the same as in April, and it, markets were not expecting inflation. Was we're not expecting inflation. Yeah, markets, we're not, in, I'm trying to get the grammar right in my head, we're not expecting inflation uh, to stay at that level. They were expecting inflation to drop in the UK, and it hasn't been dropping. And you had the Bank of England raise interest rates, I think it was 50 basis points, now to 5%. Um, and I guess the first question I wanted to throw at you, Rob, was here from my geopolitical perch, I see, well, this is Brexit. Like you, you literally just torpedoed your biggest trading relationship with your biggest trading partner. Like, of course, you're going to get inflation in the UK. But um, do you think there is something we should take from what's happening in the UK and apply it to what's going on in the rest of the West? Or do you think it's enough to say eh, that's like Brexit is sort of shaking out and the UK is literally an island and is doing its own thing and we don't need to worry about um, these disturbing inflation results? No, well, I think there's some Brexit elements to it. Um but it also, in great part, reflects what's going on more broadly. So let's talk about that. Um, I guess the first is, you know, labor is such an important issue here. And labor is one of the main issues at work in the single market, right? So I, I don't know about you, but I've been hearing that a lot of Polish immigrants, for example, are going back to Poland and are leaving England or have left England. Um, you know, kind of the proverbial Polish plumber. Uh, which was always the story, you know, in terms of lower skilled uh, or, or, you know, artisanal labor in England, um, kind of that that supply tailwind going away. Uh, you, I just have to stop you there. The, the plumber went from lower skilled labor to artisanal labor very quickly in the course of that sentence. That was quite a promotion. Well, it, it, it really depends on the plumber, right? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of nuance there. Yeah. Um. But uh, but if you look at the at the inflation print, um, you know the categories that really 
surprised are very labor intensive ones. So it's food, um, apparel, like a lot of retail categories, um, clothing, uh, restaurants. Um, and, and I think you're seeing that labor issue start to, to really rear its head. And that's really, um, that's really scary because that's not cyclical. Uh, it's it's a much more um, intractable problem, and I think we're starting to see maybe a little bit of a ghost of Christmas future for the U.S. Um, less so the eurozone, which we can talk about, but certainly an area like the U.S. where they've had um, labor shortage issues and 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 that sort of thing, but. Uh, all, all told, just not good for the UK. Not good at all. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the US then. Do you because you know why do you think that the US? Are you saying that you think that US inflation might go up here in the next couple of months? I mean, the Fed, you know, paused raising rates, but when you look at the the data, and I know you want to bring up the housing market in general. I mean, the the data in the United States has been okay. We're having, uh, or we already had Chase from Pinecone Macro on the podcast. He's coming. We're going to post that on Monday. He, uh, he is still very doom and gloom. Now, to his credit, he said, I was doom and gloom months ago and the gloom didn't happen, but here are all the reasons I'm still doom and gloom. Um, but I feel like the general narrative here is not that inflation is still a big risk in the United States. It's that it's crested and we're looking at it in the rearview mirror. So um, why do you think that that's not the case in the U.S.? Um, well, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of elements to that, right? So... I think our core expectation at the firm, based on the research that we've done, is that inflation is going to remain meaningfully higher than it's ever been. Um, and within that, it's going to be very volatile. So we just went from, in the US, like 9% headline inflation down to, I don't even know what the headline number is now, but it's like 4%. Um, so that's a big swing. But also the cycle has swung a lot. We had bottlenecks supply chain issues that had to get worked out of the system. Um, so you have to take those things aside and focus on sort of the core drivers, you know, that don't change with the cycle, but also then where are we in the cycle? Because, you know, it's no secret. And we've been talking about this a lot. You know, one of our, um, one of our key views is that we think the cycle, the risks are to the upside, like no one expects a significant reacceleration in us growth or us investment um from what i can see but i I think that's much more likely than people give it credit for especially when you look at inventories how run down they've become um there's been a lot of expectation for things to be really bad and when you know just like like chase said you know he's been doom and gloom for months and months well corporate cfos and corporate ceos have been doom and gloom as well for the most part and when the doom and gloom doesn't show up, then people's expectations start to shift and, and their actions start to shift. So I think there's a much greater chance that you get a cyclical rebound in the U.S. than a, a real sustained lurch, much, much lower from here. Um, so you have that element, that cyclical element working its way through, uh, which could lead to a reacceleration of inflation. Um, the labor issues we've, we've talked about at length um, but the other thing, you know, that we didn't really talk about is sort of, you know, everyone assumes and you always ask me this, like, why does raising rates reduce inflation? Um, and, and, you know, and I often give you kind of the stock economics book answer. Um, but, but at the same time, we've talked about sort of this paradox, because in many ways, raising rates in the US, it increases inflation rather than decreases it and this is something that i think is sort of a non-consensus view but you can see that in the data that came out just this week so the biggest data point uh, to come out earlier this week was the housing starts data in the u.s which was a huge surprise to the upside um so single family housing starts jumped to an annual level of almost a million per year that's really high. Um, The number of multifamily starts uh, is back at the highest levels above 1973, which was the previous peak. So you're seeing all of a sudden a boom in housing construction, which like how, why, why would you see that? Housing is the most cyclical part of the economy and it's the most interest rate sensitive part. 
And I think it gets to this paradox, which is um, when you raise interest rates, it causes funny things to happen sometimes. And we're seeing this in the housing market because rates went up so far so fast that people who are in their homes now, they don't want to sell them because they can't move. They can't afford to leave and to take on a mortgage at a much higher rate. So they don't leave. So what we're seeing in the housing market is the amount of inventory to buy is drying up um, to remarkable levels, even even given the, the drop in demand because of the raise in rates. And that is keeping prices elevated and it's in- incenting home builders to ramp up construction again because there's not enough supply. So here's the supply response. So you have accelerating home building in an environment where mortgage rates are almost 7%. And who would have expected that, right? Um, the, the other sort of area where the paradox is at work is in insurance. So if you think about insurance markets, the, the supply and demand in insurance is money, is capital. So when there's a lot of capital going into insurance markets, insurance prices go really low. And that's the environment that we saw throughout most of the 2010s because there was no yield to be had anywhere. So a lot of capital plowed into insurance and underwriting insurance. And so, you know, uh, premiums, it was a soft market in insurance for a very long time. And now you're seeing the opposite because in addition to all the weather related issues that are causing premiums to go up, the labor inflation, which is causing claims inflation to go up, all of that is causing insurance inflation to go up. But the big thing is capital is going away from insurance and it's going into U.S. treasuries at 5.2%. And that is causing less supply of insurance to raise the price. So we're entering a big, hard market in insurance and everyone's insurance premiums are accelerating now. And a big part of that is because rates have gone up so much. So again, who would have thunk it, you know? I mean, as a homeowner in New Orleans, I mean, we can do a personal aside here as an anecdote. I mean, my homeowner's insurance, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's up something like, I think 70, 80%. I didn't do the exact math, but I th- I vomited when I first saw the the quote on my homeowner's insurance. And that's not even counting the flood insurance, which had been capped, but I fr- there was some rule change and now it's not capped by the federal government. So flood insurance went up sort of 4X. Um, and I'm in a lucky enough position. I own my house and I'm, I'm doing okay. But like, I can't imagine that most people can afford this level of, of increase in their insurance premiums. And I'm, I'm actually wondering how many people are going to, at least in coastal areas like New Orleans or parts of Florida or places where climate risk is more pronounced and where insurance companies are just packing up and leaving. They were packing up and leaving before the Federal Reserve started hiking rates. It's not because they could get 5.2% in treasury. It's just because the logic didn't work. Um, I wonder if we're going to have a little bubble here of people who own homes but don't have insurance on them. Um but I don't know that that's maybe a sort of a separate thing. Um, the I was looking up the U.S. CPI print while you were talking. You were right; it was up four um, percent. Um, but um, a couple interesting things when you actually drill down to it, it, it really is a little. It's a little more complicated than that because the reason it's just four percent is because energy is down almost twelve percent year on year. We had such a huge spike in energy, and energy's really come down in a big way since then. Food prices, though, are up 6.7%. Uh, and I'm not a mathematician, but I know that's more than four. Uh, all items, less food and energy, 5.3%. And when you drill down to that a little bit, you see that services is also up at 6.6% in terms of inflation going forward. So I think you're right that the CPI print, that there's nothing really comforting in that CPI print, I think, from the United States. Because if you're looking at food, if you're looking at services, we're still in the six to seven percent range. We're not even close to the headline, which is four percent, which is being driven, um, which is being driven by those lower energy prices. And I think you and I think that's not going to stay the same. I mean, we've I've, I've been bearish oil here for a couple of months, but we also just got a little bit bullish natural gas because prices have come come down so much. And you got to th- I can't believe we're already thinking ahead to the winter now. But as you get into the winter and changing weather patterns, like I mean, maybe we get another warm winter like we did this past year, but I don't know. It doesn't look like it, it seems to me we keep ping ponging back and forth with energy and that really, you know, if, if you even get a, re- a reversion to the mean of energy prices over the last 12 to 18 months, I mean, inflation is going to look a lot worse. Yeah. And, and volatility plays a role in this too. Um, 
you know, we often talk about geopolitical and global volatility and how that's rising long term, and, and everyone kind of knows that. But um, specifically on the energy front, you know, as you know, you and I just had a, a really interesting conversation with a listener of the podcast who's a, a natural gas trader and, and advisor. And one of the things uh, that we just spoke about was just the the volatility of demand um, and how you know that's that's really gone up a lot um, in part because uh, for power generation there's less switching between coal and natural gas than there than there once was. Um, but you know when you combine the volatility of weather going up with the volatility of sort of energy markets themselves going up in, in that way. Um, you have a recipe for big moves in both directions. So natural gas prices are two dollars and sixty cents uh, per MCS, but that's at it's touching generational lows. So which you don't have to be a natural gas expert to say what's more likely to happen. Is it going to go down another fifty percent, or is it going to triple? <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, just, just thinking about food, I mean, that trade has also gone in our favor a little bit in the last couple of weeks because of very bad weather um, in the Midwest, dry weather in general. So, I mean, corn has been levitating a bit. Wheat has finally been levitating a bit. And you start looking at the global picture, that doesn't look great either. Um, there was another call we were on this week that I, I thought relates to what we're talking about, Rob, because I thought you made a really good point about the value and importance of liquidity right now in this current market. I think a lot of you know, you talked about how in recent years it's been about tying up investments and private equity or or things like that. And I thought you, I thought it'd be good just to make the case to listeners why liquidity is probably going to be at a premium here in the next couple of years because I think it dovetails with some of these with the volatility and changes that we're talking about. And it's not a narrative I see out there in general being talked about. Yeah. Um, so I think the general view that we have is that liquidity is undervalued. So if you look at what uh, big investors are doing, pension funds, endowments, what they have been doing for the last 20 years, the Yale model. The Yale model is based on buying illiquidity and the notion that by tying up your money, um, you earn higher returns. And if you're an endowment who has, I mean, they never spend the money, so I don't even know what their time horizon is. 500 years, is Harvard ever going to burn through that $60 billion? I'm probably <laughs> not. Um, so un unlimited time horizon, you can afford to lock up your money for a very long time. And in theory, you get, you get higher returns by doing this. The problem is this has been going on for so long that um, now it's the opposite. You pay a premium to lock up your money, which is nuts. When you think about it, you're paying a privilege to not have flexibility. Um, but that's what all the academic research shows is, you know, the rush into private equity, into private lending, into private real estate. Everyone wants these things in part because you don't have to mark them to market. And that is easier for professional money managers to deal with. Um, but, but the, you know, kind of underlying problem is that you have not enough liquidity in the market. Um, and you can already see sort of strange signs of this. Like if you look at the bond market, um, in many ways, it's much less liquid than it was even 10 years ago, even for something like US treasuries. Um, so that's a big theme, but taking it back and away from, you know, a financial market viewpoint and just looking at if you're running a business, if you're, you know, operating out in the world, um, if the world is more volatile, as we think it is, and technology changes and shifts are going to be more sudden and volatile and dramatic as we think they are, then you really need to think about the value of liquidity because we haven't had to worry about that for a very long time. Um, one way to think about this is go back to the late 1970s, the early 1980s when inflation was at its peak. Valuations of assets were at crazy lows. Like everyone looks back now and says, hey, the S&P 500 traded at seven times earnings or something nuts. Um, but at the time, that sort of made sense. And the reason is because those were businesses that had sunk costs in 
physical businesses and the the uh, the depreciation on their books didn't reflect the higher inflation the higher inflation you would need for maintenance for for replacement of of assets that are being retired and this is sort of a wonky accounting based argument but the point being that when you're sunk into something that you don't have the flexibility to get out of very easily when inflation is sustainably higher the valuation of that is lower that's just less attractive you don't want to be in there and i think this is the big thing that people miss like everyone talks about you know oh geopolitical volatility and the world's getting you know crazier and less predictable and cycles are shorter and and steeper and yet everyone's lining up to put their money into venture capital and private equity and to own physical assets like you really ought to rethink those assumptions because that's the opposite of what you want to be doing in this environment. Um, you want to have flexibility to seize the opportunities when they come and to get out of the way when the bad things start coming down, you know, the train track as well. It's funny as you're saying that I, I feel like one of the one of the only industries that is that has taken this to heart in part because they did so much investment um, in fixed assets and things like that are energy companies right now, which are not investing in more, you know, uh, more exploration and more things like that. They're they're holding cash or they're paying dividends or things like that, and that eventually will also have another inflationary effect because these low energy prices that we're experiencing right now, uh, if energy companies are sitting on their hands because they see exactly what you're talking about, I mean, eventually the rubber is going to sort of meet the road there. So maybe in that sense, the energy companies have their finger on the pulse of the economy better than just about anybody else right now. Is that fair? Yeah, totally. I mean, who wants to commit to a twenty five year projects when not only do you not know what energy technology is going to win out or how long it will take ultimately for crude oil demand to decline 50 percent um but also what's going to happen in venezuela or colombia or mexico or uh or saudi arabia uh, like that's just too long a time horizon in the sort of world that we are in right now so the, the risk premium on those sorts of assets needs to go up. Yeah. Um, before we sort of leave the inflation side of the argument, I thought it's worth sort of keeping track of multipolarity and deglobalization and pointing out that even as uh, Great Britain is looking at higher inflation and raising rates in the United States, we're talking about uh, maybe like there's more inflation here than we think. Um, you look at the other side of the world and China's in the exact opposite position. We've talked about China and the treadmill to hell a couple of times on the podcast. We don't want to we don't, we don't have to rehash the whole argument, but I do think it is worth saying very briefly that, you know, the Chinese government or the, I should say the People's Bank of China cut cut their main interest rate this week, not by a whole lot, 10 basis points, 10 basis points is going to move markets. More interesting was what the state council said last week. They say they're working on some big propose or uh, some big initiative that's going to be a bunch of stimulus and we don't have the details on it you know the the magic words demand side stimulus were in there from one of the from one of the guys who was talking but there was also plenty of infrastructure and plenty of the supply side plenty of the the grab bag of other things but i do think it's just worth pointing out that even as we have this conversation about the united states and europe in china it's the complete opposite um, and I think you also have to keep that in mind when the big geopolitical news of the week, even though I frankly find it kind of boring because it's been in the cards there for at least a month or so now is, you know, are the United States and China trying to find a more pragmatic basis upon which to deal with each other? Uh, I'm extremely skeptical, but Blinken was over there and they had their deep and constructive talks. I don't know if you saw this, Rob, but the apparently the next day, uh, Biden referred to she as a dictator offhand at a i think at a california fundraising event and the chinese are already was very very upsetting we're very offended we can't believe you would do this they sailed an aircraft carrier group through the taiwan strait they probably meant to do that anyway um as an aside chinese people really don't like it when you call she a dictator i, I remember giving a speech in canada in 2019 and I offhand did the same thing Biden did. I was like, yeah, you know, China authoritarian regime with Xi as a dictator. And this one speaker on the panel with me uh, was this uh, Chinese uh, citizen, I, some analyst, I forget what her name was. And she followed me around for the rest of the conference, lecturing me on how she was not a dictator. And I thought the lady doth protest too much a little bit. But anything you want to add about, about China maybe before we start talking about cars a little bit? Well, I think the issue 
Um, I was thinking about this because I was listening to one of your interviews on the pod where you're talking about authoritarians and their ability to do things much, much more quickly and easily than we do in democratic societies. And this, the thought struck me that whether you call him a dictator or not, the irony is that exactly what China needs, and, and this is getting to the news this week about demand side stimulus, supply side stimulus, you know, whatever. Um, what they need is not what a dictator traditionally can provide. Like a dictator does not empower individual people. A dictator empowers his own regime or, you know, in some cases empowers corporations that are tied with the dictator. So, you know, look at any authoritarian regime and it's the people who are running big organizations at the top who tend to, to do well. And the irony is what China needs right now is they need every Chinese person to just get a check in the mail and to have you know their real incomes go up and to take money out of the pockets of the people who are running companies and running governments, local governments, and give it to the people. Not to oversimplify, but that's at the end of the day what it is. But the problem is that's, that's empowering individuals and that's very difficult. Um, I think for authoritarian regimes to do, they don't really do that from an economic standpoint. It's not how they typically work. It's much easier to control the supply side and to push through building projects and push through um, stimulus to to incent you know new factories and and new power plants. But when it's about having more money to to buy things for middle class households or, or lower class households you know that's somehow very difficult for them so either anyway that's well no the, the 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 real irony in what you're saying is that what china really needs is not emperor xi it needs the chinese communist party to actually be a communist party the communist parties are supposed to be good at redistributing wealth and the chinese communist party has not but i mean yes it has marxist forms and they talk about I'm sure they have sessions on dialectical materialism and socialism with chinese characteristics but for the last 30 years socialism with chinese characteristics has been you know, state-led capitalism and the doctrine of enrichment for most of society. Um, but I, I mean, this also goes to, this is maybe the most important thing that's happening in the world right now. So I think it's worth talking about a little bit. In China, the other thing that's happening is, you know, you have, you have the private companies and then you have the state-owned enterprises. And we can talk about the distinctions between those two, but I think there are distinctions to be had between them. For instance, you know, a Huawei is more like a Microsoft and a ZTE is more like, an, but anyway, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. There's a company, there's, there's the individuals that you're talking about, hundreds of millions of whom are still living on something like $5 a day or something like that. And then there's these local governments. And I think, I think that's where she is going. And that might be where the dictator actually can do some things. Because if he can stack enough provincial bureaucrats so that he can take money away from the local governments and from the provincial officials and all the people that have been you know, enriched by the economy but are not doing productive things for the economy or are not consuming, like it seems very clear that that's, that's the class that she has in the crosshairs. And that just comes down to a simple question. Can he bear the political cost of either replacing the provincial officials or taking money away from the local governments and saying, no, 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 no. Like it's the Chinese communist party. Like the, the directives come from Beijing and Beijing will decide what, what happens to those things. Um, so I, I think that's the sort of third piece and I don't envy Xi, but I, I have to imagine that he sees this and that that is at least some of what China is building towards. But to your point, you know, when they actually get down to it, they usually blink. It's more supply side reform. It's let's knock 10 basis points off the interest rate. It's let's have some subsidies so that maybe people will want to spend more. They're going to have to do something a little more radical probably if they want to change um, the demand behavior of the Chinese consumer. Well, that's why, you know, the data points we've gotten in the last week or two have been so disappointing because it's sort of you're waiting for him to act. And, and I don't want to I don't want to count him out. And and frankly, uh, in many ways, I'm rooting for Xi because I think if anyone can try to rebalance things there, barring some, you know, representative democratic turnover, which ain't going to happen anytime soon, it's, I think it's him. 
you know, people always, always talk about, he has this yellow earth complex from the time that he spent living in a cave during the cultural revolution and mm -hmm. sort of working side by side with, with ordinary people. And that, that, that was such a foundational part of his character and who he used himself to be. Well, let's see it. You know, um, time is, is ticking and the, every month, every quarter that he doesn't go after those vested interests in the name of the people that he claims to represent. I don't know if he can or if he won't, but it's not a good sign. Um, and I think he needs to do it if they're going to avoid serious, serious economic problems. Yeah. Again, the irony that like the world, uh, wants to call she a dictator, but then also the global economy sort of needs she to be a dictator if things are going to go well for the global economy going forward. But to your point, if we, if you were going to spin it from a more optimistic perspective, I mean, he became China's paramount leader in 2013 and he was not the first choice. Um, he was just the one that all the factions could agree on. I think people didn't think Xi Jinping was going to be what he has become and he has seized power he's been eliminating factions he's been going after high level corrupt officials and anybody that could challenge him uh he was rubber stamped for a th unprecedented third presidential term or leadership term whatever you want to call it in march um without any successor name so um we can say he, he's not moving fast enough the time is ticking we can also say well maybe the clock started in march like maybe March is when he says, okay, I have no rivals. I have cleared the deck. There is no successor that has been empowered waiting in the wings. I have crushed all dissent. Maybe now I can do it. But to your point, um, the state council dithering about you know, interest rate reductions of 10 base, that's not the sort of thing that has to be thought about. But you would also think that if he is going to make that sort of move, it would be shock and awe. Um, I wanted to close by talking about cars um, and the auto industry. And I've been thinking about it because, as you know, I've been doing a lot of research on natural gas and renewable diesel and sustainable air fuel and all, and all these other things. I'm sure it's I'm sure the listeners are bored hearing that I'm doing all this research and they haven't heard anything or read anything from me about it. Don't worry, it's going to come eventually. Uh, but I, I was reading more in in you know, uh, Vaclav Smil's Energy and Civilization and History. By the way, I don't know if I... I can't remember if I made this joke on the podcast or not yet, but the the top line of this book, Rob, is I is from Bill Gates. It's a 2017 quote, and it says, "I wait for new smell books the 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 way some people wait for the next Star Wars movie." Um, what a load of bullshit! Like this is a really really good book, and like I'm really glad I'm reading it. And the dude is super smart, but like if Bill Gates is real, like, and I, I have, I have authors like that, like Robert Caro, I'm waiting for the fifth LBJ volume. It's going to be like Harry Potter for me, but this is not written like Robert Caro and it doesn't have the emotional weight of star Wars. So can we, anyway, uh, just no, a little, if you, you're, you're right. Smill is as someone who's read every one of his books. Like you have to sit down and, you know, get good posture and uh, it's rough yeah. going. It's rough yeah, going. There's no lightsabers or Jedi's or, you know, no Wookiees coming in for comedic relief. You're like desperate for comedic relief as, as you get this, this deluge of information. Anyway, but he's talking, uh, the chapter that I'm in right now, he's talking about how cars brought maybe the most profound transformation of the modern era. And the thing that stuck out to me was he talked about how cars became really the leading industry in terms of product value in developing markets. And that all sorts of industries like steel, rubber, glass, plastics, oil refining, it's all about going to cars and making cars. And I, I already alluded to the uh, Wall Street Journal front page, but let's go to Bloomberg's front page for today. Here's, here's the first couple of headlines on it's Thursday, June 22nd, 1150 AM, New Orleans, uh, New Orleans time. Uh, the big take, Ford gets $9.2 billion to help US catch up with China's electric vehicle dominance. Next story, Volkswagen's EV battery keeps executives up at night. Next story, US transport chief wants to break China's EV hold. Next story, Tesla seen staying as top EV seller in the United States. And we've seen Tesla's stock levitate in general. Uh, there's more going on in the world than cars. And I just have this sense of, of I mean, like, I, I get that the auto industry is a big deal. I. I were a two car household, despite the fact that we could very easily just be a one car household. I, the hypocrisy is not lost on me here. Um, but man, it just seems like, um, there's been a real overemphasis on the auto industry in general. And now the auto industry is changing and we're all just supposed, supposed to accept that we're going to switch to EVs and we're all going to replace the cars that we used to buy with these new EVs that are also going to have chips in them. There, there's just something 
really bothering me about the auto industry. And I, I haven't articulated a take that is any more eloquent than that, but I thought you would be the person to go to with it to start thinking about it. Cars are funny because cars are in many ways the, the biggest test of a, of a country. And I think that gets to the fact that people greatly underestimate how difficult it's going to be to make this EV transition. So frankly, I worry a lot about Ford and GM and uh, these companies that are trying to make a transition to a whole new capital base. Like if you look at what these companies are doing, they're locking in enormous liabilities in order to build new factories, to build EV capacity, to build lithium processing capacity, everything that you need while running their existing business. This isn't a new startup. This is trying to juggle with one hand what is an exceptionally difficult industry while starting up something completely new on the other hand. Um, and frankly, I, I don't expect them to, to do it flawlessly. Um, and if they mess up, they're going to have major problems given the scale of debt and liabilities involved. Um, so that's a major shoe to watch just at the industry level. From a country level, I think it's really interesting because as you point out, as, or as Bob Club Spill points out rather, autos are such a huge portion of the value add in developing countries. And I say it's the biggest test of a country because autos in many ways are like the epitome of um, of development. You've made it. If you can make an auto that people actually want to buy. And if you look, look at Japan, for instance, um, they're the classic case. But the thing that's so hard about autos is it requires expertise in three things. You need expertise in the materials that go into them. So you need to be able to make steel, for instance, and make the right kinds of steel, which is sort of the lowest rung of the ladder. If this is a video game, that's, you know, level one. <laughs> but a car is also an extremely complex industrial machine. It's a it's a very, very complicated machine. So you need to be able to build that efficiently and uh, you know not going over cost i mean it's 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 like an orchestra that needs to be uh, uh managed and then the third level you know if that's level two the third level is not only do you have to make the materials and understand that and have the supply chains not only do you have to orchestrate the building of this of this machine it has to be something that people like it's a consumer product it has to look cool you have to come out with a new one every year that looks different enough that people will get excited. You have to capture the trends all while orchestrating that with the other levels uh, of the of the pyramid. So that's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to build these complicated machines and make them look nice and make people desire them. So um that's why you have like the company, the countries that build cars, you can list them on one hand. Um, so it's an extremely difficult test and the energy transition is just going to be, um, make it much, much harder and it's going to disrupt the existing players. Um, so you can see China is, is a rising giant in EVs. Look at the amount of market share that China is taking in Europe. For example, right now, um, that's a huge. Like you don't see changes like that. I think the numbers are something like China has six percent to ten percent of the European market now, and they're projected to have almost thirty percent of the use of the new car market by twenty twenty six. That's a that's a, a market share change that's unprecedented in cars. Like usually, it's one or two percentage points per year. Um, so I, I guess what I'm coming away with is like the complexity, the difficulty is often underestimated. Um, the existing companies that are trying to keep up that orchestra while doing this vastly difficult new thing, I think a lot of them are going to screw up. And and now the rubber's hitting the road as far as how they're scaling these operations. Um, and then you have the disruption cross country where the new energy um, sort of transition is opening the doors to new players, um, especially with EVs, because 
it's very different with the platforms. You can have more unified platforms and then individual players can modify them more easily. So the whole nature of the of the industry is changing. I'm not that was kind of a grab bag of thoughts that I don't know if you want to hook on to any of those and go deeper. Well, no, because because it relates to what we were just talking about with China, because it, you can tell and this is where state run capitalism actually does work, because you can tell that somewhere in a room five, 10 years ago, the Chinese Communist Party said we will dominate electric vehicles and we will do that because we make a lot of the steel and we're the ones who refine and process all the critical minerals that go into these batteries. We are going to have all of the advantages here. And to your point, in, in some ways, I wonder if it's a Pyrrhic victory because I sort of I, I have my doubts about whether electric vehicles are going to be the answer here because they don't actually and, and this is but the, the thing that makes me stop well, let me complete that sentence before i move on to the next sentence too much coffee for me this morning um you know it, it seems to me that electric vehicles don't actually make that much sense because you're trading dependence on say oil um, for a host of other critical mineral commodities that are maybe even more destructive to the environment to mine we can just call out you know cobalt and lithium and all the things that are happening there so we're you know what is the real gain there if you can net it all out um, but the the flip side of as the flip side of that is that cars don't really make sense in cities at all. Like I understand why you would need a car if you're living in the suburbs and you want to get back and forth from one place to another. I get in the United States, especially in the West, having a car because the distances are so vast and population density is so low. But how is it that we have cars in all of these even like high density cities? instead of high speed rail or buses and things like that like that makes a lot more sense from an efficiency point of view um so yeah i, I guess the point i'm trying to make here though is that china may have maybe betting on electric vehicles and today they're stealing market share for electric vehicles and it looks like they're going to be dominant but maybe they're going to be dominant in something that isn't going to matter five ten years from now because the technology is going to change or the logic of the economy is going to change um you know, I, I I drive around an 07 Accord, uh, as my wife will tell you. It smells like I've been you know going swimming in the pool and then driving in the car for 15 years because that's what I've been doing. I sort of find it homely and comfortable, but whatever. Most people think it's kind of gross. But I don't want to go buy an electric vehicle because I'm not convinced. First of all, like this is the first generation of electric vehicles. I'm not convinced they're that good. And all my friends tell me, oh, this thing, this this brake thing didn't work, or this chip and the thing didn't work. Um, and then, but I'm not even convinced that five years from now that EVs are really going to be the thing. Is it going to be hydrogen fuel cell vehicles? Is it going to be some other vehicle that I've never heard of before? Is it going to be normal combustion engines and it's all just going to be renewable diesel, or we're going to make some new biofuel from? You know something that we haven't even talked about yet um so i'm i'm like sitting here you know throwing hundreds of dollars into fixing my shitty car's air conditioning because i don't feel comfortable with throwing money at a new car because i like i like what what new car should i buy sort of situation so in some ways it's very personal for me and trying to connect the macro to all these other things but the that was a little convoluted my point was just maybe china chose a lemon like maybe it wasn't such a smart idea to decide to become the center of the of the electric vehicle universe and it is weird to see it is weird for me to see ford and gm and all these other companies it's like oh china's stealing market share let's now copy china let's try and you know take back like it's already done like you can't tesla's the only one that has a chance and tesla's already struggling with things like nickel and other mineral commodities that are going to go into their cars and everything else they're not going to be able to compete with china once china has a homegrown domestic option and people who are buying cars are going to want cheap reliable cars they're like some people will buy the teslas but a lot of people like you're saying in europe they just want the cheap cars that work um so it, it just feels like there's a lot of disruption there it's sort of like cars 100 years ago in some ways when you have these energy transitions there's a massive amount of uncertainty and a massive amount of energy that's lost so to speak in the sense of you know, economic waste and huge investments that go nowhere. You know, a hundred years ago, a lot of people would have told you that battery powered cars then would have been the dominant technology until ICE vehicles, you know, showed that they were clearly the option. So think about all the, all the companies and all the countries that were trying to build battery cars or they built them and then they all went kaput. Um, well, and, and this is sort of the point that's that's maybe bothering me the most because like that all makes like everything I just said, I think makes sense. Um, but when you look at the level of um, dependence that all of these different industries have on the auto industry doing well, it, we're probably not going to let the auto industry fail. 
it's probably too big to fail. Um, another thing that's in the smell book is we sell more than 90% of all vehicles on credit. I mean, I guess it's just cars and houses, right? Can you imagine selling everything else on credit? We we have we have weighted the scale so much in favor of the audio the auto industry to keep it going, rather than say improving cars or investing in high speed rail or making better airplanes or things like that. Um, and I don't know. I, th- I thought the <laughs> I was I was arguing with my hosts in North Dakota last week. They kept on referring to the market, and the market is smart, and the market will make things work. And you talk about that sometimes on the podcast too. And I'm still waiting to encounter a true market out there because none of these things look like markets. It looks like somebody always has their finger on the scale. You just have to find out who. Um, yeah. Well, it's very mixed, and as someone who comes from a short selling background, I'm very attuned to when markets screw up um so I'm, I'm definitely sympathetic with that um but just tying it to to our earlier conversation about liquidity and flexibility i think i think this is just another manifestation of that because you don't know what's going to happen china's made this big bet because they can because they have a regime decides 10 years from now, hey, we want to be dominant in this technology. Is that the right one? I don't know. I'm really skeptical. I look at someone like Toyota and how they've hedged their bets uh, so aggressively. And I suspect that they're the smart player at the card table. Um, But you don't want to be China in, in whatever business you're in, in this environment, because things are changing too quick. Um, you don't want to, you don't want to lay it all down on one specific bet, you know, just generally with investing with your human capital, with your career, you know, all these people who, uh, who went into coding because it was the hot new thing, you know, five years ago, how many of those people are going to have jobs, (laughs) you know? So because AI or, you know, whatever, pick your, pick your trend. But the broader point is, Things are really changing fast. And to the extent that you can, you want to step back, maintain the flexibility to see where things are going to shake out and then and then move. And if you look a hundred years ago, the companies that were the the winners were not the first companies necessarily. They were they were the companies that saw and waited and then when the dust had settled, then moved in. And I think that's a, a good strategy more generally right now. Yeah. Um, anything else on your mind, Rob, or you want to end it short and sweet there this week? Let's end it short and sweet. I got to get home, help out with the kids. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't want to overtax you with the combination of the emotional distress of Marcus Smart getting traded and you're probably on Corsica, Corsican culture time now as well so let's not push you too hard right well the amount of uh, the amount of smoked meats and, and pork that I ate in the last mm. uh, week um, I'm a few steps slower than usual we'll just say <sighs> well on that note we'll talk to you all soon Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.